Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite, or whatever the case may be. My name is Marcus, and I am the host of the Black Brazil Today YouTube channel, as well as the BlackBrazilToday.com blog, where I analyze Brazil from the perspective of race. So tonight, I want to just uh, do a, a quick uh, review or discussion of uh, four movies that discuss racism in Brazil. And I, I think this is a really important topic. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be talking more about uh, just the changes in Brazil's mainstream media, particularly over the last decade. Um, you know, all the while, and I, I've said repeatedly, like you, my journey into Brazil started in the, at the, the end of 1999. And my first trip was in uh, August, September of uh, the year 2000. So I have like 23 years of memories and uh, research and uh, just all around fascination with the topic of uh, the situation with uh, Afro-Brazilians. And I can attest to the fact that for a number of years, okay, first of all, Brazil's film industry was in, it it, um, it was almost non-existent for, for many years. Uh if you go back to the 60s, um, there were some great movies that was coming out of Brazil with what was called the uh, Cinema Novel. It was uh, just a, a new era in filmmaking. And you had a, a lot of really good Brazilian films coming out at that time. But then it was like sometime before and after the, the military dictatorship, the the Brazil's film industry almost just it, it just almost stopped making films altogether. Um, if, if you go to Brazil today and go to any movie theater, you know, uh, most of the film theaters that I ever went to while I was in Sao Paulo and even the ones of Bahia, uh, most of the film theaters I ever went to were located inside of like shopping malls and, um, going all the way back to the, you know, the year 2000, I think the first time I watched a film in a, in a theater in, in Bahia, you know, uh, Northeastern state. It was the film uh, Cidade de Deus, you know, City of God. It was a movie that uh, got a lot of accolades worldwide. It was it was considered a great movie, you know, in terms of its cinematography, you know, the, the storyline. You know, uh, it was another one of those films that I asked a question where it, you, you had a large black cast in City of the City of God film, but it portrayed this gangsterism side of black life in, in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, you know, obviously they were, uh, you know, the black characters were involved in drug trafficking. It was a bloody gory movie. It was a lot of murder going on. And it's just, um, you have to ask yourself after watching that type of film, like, okay, if someone didn't live in Brazil and they saw a city of God, what, what image would they have of the black population? That's that's the question that I asked, you know, even as I remember sitting in that theater, like, you know, I had just in the few years at that time that I had been, you know, just immersing myself in all things Brazil. I noticed that most of the films that I watched uh, coming out of Brazil just had very little black representation in those films. And it definitely weren't any issues that uh, address the issue of race. You know, as I, I've said this over and over, anybody who's dealt with Brazil knows that for many years, it was uh, most Brazilians just didn't want to deal with the race issue. People pretended as if it didn't exist. You know, even when I meet, you know, white Brazilians to this day, it's when I bring the discussion up, if I bring the discussion up, sometimes I, I don't even want to deal with the issue because it's like I know how people are going to react. And I'd rather just not go through all of that. It's um. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty amazing, you know, I mean, how Americans deal with race and how Brazilians deal with race, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's flip sides of the coin. It's like, uh, Americans, here it is 2023 and it, the, the racial antagonism that you had in the United States has put everybody on edge. Um, we've seen some you know, the reactions that people have these days, you know, even I have to admit, like, it's gone way overboard. You know, the idea that 
everything, just totally everything has to do with race or racism in the country. And sometimes it's just not the case. Whereas in Brazil, because you didn't have what was considered legalized segregation in the country, people had this belief that, you know, racism was a thing that only happened in the United States or, you know, uh, apartheid era South Africa. Like, no, those are where the racist, those are the racist countries. You know, we all mix here. There's no legalized segregation in the country. So even African-Americans who would travel to Brazil, you know, in the last, you know, since say the 1930s were under this belief that because you didn't have legalized segregation in Brazil, there were no race problems. Of course, you know, with all of the information, data, studies, books, you know, dissertations that have come out over the years, of course, that's a lie. You know, there, there are studies about race in Brazil going all the way back to the 1940s. But the general, even these studies were kind of limited to academia, because if you talk to the average person, again, people would reproduce this idea like, no, 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 we don't have that problem here. You know, it would always be a situation where, you know, I have black friends, you know, or I have black people in my family. So automatically that leads to the idea like, well, how can we have racism here when we have this proximity between the, you know, the races, right? But it doesn't really proximity doesn't really prove anything if everybody has in their mind that these people are inferior to us and people will deny it on the surface. But then you read some of the things that people say just in everyday discourse, everyday conversations. You know, you look at the invisibility of black people in the media. Um, black Brazilian men have long had prominence on soccer fields. Some of the greatest players in you know soccer history come out of Brazil. But. It, one of the unknown or really hidden facts is that when soccer was first brought to Brazil from the British, black players were excluded from some of the, you know, the popular soccer teams of the time. It wasn't until they started realizing like, wow, we can never become, you know, a, a soccer powerhouse in, unless we start using some of this talent coming out of the poor black neighborhoods. And then years later, it was like, it was the black players who were dominating, you know, these, these fields and leading Brazil to four and then their fifth World Cup. Of course, it's been over 20 years since their last World Cup victory. But, you know, the point is, if, if you're looking to find history uh, from the racial perspective in Brazil and you're looking for the exact same thing that happened in the United States, then you may come away thinking like, oh, Brazil is, it doesn't have any racism. There's no problems there. But when you, like I said, when you pull back the curtains and you really take a look at what you see there, in some ways, the type of racism that you see in Brazil is actually kind of worse than what you see in the United States. Now, I know I always get Brazilians who would disagree with that. But, you know, look at this, you know, look at the data side by side. I mean, look at, again, the, the invisibility of black people in advertising, invisibility in, in uh, television, the portrayal when they are in films and television series, you know, how they're depicted. Um, when we see the, the low numbers of black folks in certain positions throughout the society, this is something that's only changed recently because, you know, it, it's been a couple of decades of affirmative action now, but, you know, some people would say, well, when black people get education, then, then everything will be even, but that's not, ne that's still not necessarily the case. Um, why, if, 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 if it's been this long where, uh, Brazilian elites claim to have a pride about this mixed race population and black population. It, it, I mean, it's just like the contradictions just come out. If, if you feel this proud, then why is it that, you know, these people are invisible when, you know, when, when you look in their media, when you look at uh, how people are depicted, this, you know, I've seen this just over and over. And it's just like every realm of society that I've looked at, you know, uh, the, the Candomblé religion, to this day, there had there continue to be like violent attacks against this religion that is of African origin. You know that, that <laughs> the 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 murders of young black males. You know one of the films that I'm going to discuss here now. Just you know it's it's a discussion like well if everything is equal here, how come you see so many non-white people being killed by the police and being murdered in just everyday street violence? You know I, how do people deal with that? It's like. Oh, well, you Americans had the KKK. 
Like, okay, yeah, the United States had KKK. There's no denying that. But when you look at the number of murders carried out between what happens in the U.S., what happens in Brazil, even when you take the Ku Klux Klan at its most violent era, those numbers can't compare to how many black people are killed by police in Brazil every day. You know, you, you won't call it the KKK, but, you know, death squads run amok in Brazil. You know, it's just black bodies all over the place, just dropping like flies. And people want to just reject the race issue. You know, I had somebody post on my blog or on the uh, YouTube channel like last week or the week before. Like, oh, here's another. Uh, what did it say? I think it was something um, more leftist vichimista, you know. What they're saying is you know, you're, you're another person who's on the left and, and you're playing the victim again. Right. And it, it's intriguing because you can never really satisfy both sides. You know, um, I've had people, you know, come at me and, and discuss, you know, my politics because, you know, I mean, quite frankly, my views have changed over the last decade. You know, I just, you know, I, I ask this question to black people over and over again. How far to the left can you go before you fall off the cliff? And so it seems to me in the mind of the extreme left, anything that's slightly, even slightly to the right of the extreme left makes you, an, you know, a conservative Republican. You're somebody on the right side of the political spectrum, which I, I don't consider myself at all. It's like no matter what I say, I'm going to get <laughs> I'm going to get some some smoke from either the left or the right. And you know, I've said for a while now, I feel like I politically I put myself somewhere in the middle. Um you know, I, I have to acknowledge that there has to be a change of mindset within the black community, whether we're talking about in the United States or we're talking about Brazil, because at a certain point, we cannot blame everything on racism it, in the ways that black people uh, are not ready to be prepared or not prepared to give our best effort to get ahead in life. You know, sometimes a lot of times that plays a factor. But anyway, I'm, I'm getting off of my topic. I want to stay focused on these um these four films because I, I find it intriguing just like in the last decade you've had a, an opening for more afro-brazilian film directors uh, more afro-brazilians are di directing series on television you know screenwriters producers directors it's 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 you know compared to what i've seen since i've been studying brazil it's a, it's an incredible surge uh it's it, it, these people are so talented that they can no longer just continue to shut the door you know, on these, uh, I will say audio video, audio visual, uh, creators, some really great filmmakers is coming out of Brazil these days. And not only is it just the filmmakers, but they're bringing black stories they're bringing black cast they're bringing black pro protagonists in these films. Like I said, if you go back to the nineties and the early two thousands, you just didn't see this. If you, you just look at, you know, the, just like the, the, the CD and box covers, of Brazilian films, and you're going to see mostly white faces. So um, the, the fact that not only are they having more black people behind the cameras and in front of the cameras, but they're actually discussing things, issues that are being discussed in the black community. This isn't, an, this is, uh, it's revolutionary, you could say. So let me um just go ahead and get into this piece. Um, four movies that discuss racism in Brazil. So here's uh, just the four covers of these four films that will be reviewed here. So today's piece is, uh, you know, that I'm reacting to is by an, uh, the writer of the article's name, Victoria Hondon. And she's, this is what she's discussing, films that portray the fight against racism and for equal rights in Brazilian society. So she says, for centuries, Brazil was based on slave labor. The regime was abolished in 1888, but at the time, little was done to equalize and include free blacks in the society. In fact, many were free without conditions to work and study. Although the situation seems distant from the current scenario, this reflected on the development of contemporary society. So when she speaks on slavery, as I've said repeatedly, you know, many of us are familiar with slavery in the United States, but do we know that anywhere from, I don't know, 10 to 12 more Africans were imported into Brazil as enslaved labor. Uh, Brazil abolished slavery like 25 years after the United States in 1888 on May 13th. And the effects of 
you know, slavery in Brazilian society can still be felt today in the uh, social inequalities, right? So, look, you know, just these articles, but when I first started studying the situation, the argument was that there were 4 million Africans brought to Brazil. And, but later on, more studies started coming out saying that these numbers were actually closer to 5 million. So, we, slaves, African, enslaved Africans who were sent to the United States equals less than like 400,000, whereas in Brazil, the numbers are saying that it's closer to 5 million. So, we know about slavery in the United States and, you know, more information continues to come out. But to, to get a full understanding, we have to look at the diaspora in the Americas, because when we look at all of the slavery that happened, if I'm not mistaken, it's like only 4% of all the enslaved Africans ended up in the United States, where the other 96% went to Latin America and the Caribbean. So these are all stories. Uh, Brazil has its own commission talking about black slavery. Um, there's a discussion of reparations. It's nowhere near the discussion that, that's going on in the United States. Well, I don't hear a lot about it anymore, but um, that is a discussion that you hear in Brazil, the controversial debate over reparations for slavery in Brazil. So slavery had an indelible mark on the society. You know, a lot, a lot of people still to this day, because of that history of slavery, they still look at black Brazilians as they're only meant to serve white people. There's actually an, an article on the blog that actually talks about that. Um, let me see here. Africans are responsible for slavery and the country owes black population nothing for slavery. This was the view of the then candidate for president, Jair Bolsonaro. So Brazil has a long history of slavery. You know, it's something that, you know, studies still come out about. In some ways, a lot of historians will say slavery was much more brutal in Brazil than it was in the United States. So anyway, as demonstrated by data from the study, Jovens Negros e o Mercado de Trabalho, meaning young blacks in the labor market, commissioned by the World Bank to the Afro Research Center of the Brazilian Center for Analysis and Planning, or CBRAP. Although the black population represents 56% of Brazilians, this proportion of the population has the least access to education, health care, and the labor market. Now, I always have to go back and just... <laughs> When they say Brazil population is 56% black, I mean, you have to take that with a grain of salt, you know, uh, as you know, for years, I accepted that idea. Uh, but the, again, the mixture, what makes, how they come to the 56% black population in Brazil is saying that pretos and pardos, which means blacks and browns or blacks and mixed people represent 56 of the 56 percent of the population when about 95 percent no 95 million of those blacks and browns are represented by what's called the brown or pardu population and as i've said repeatedly all of those pardus mixed people cannot be considered black i would say probably the majority should probably not be considered black you know I, we can never know unless we go through you know, it's like 210, 215 million Brazilians today. But just in my experience in the country, I know that you can't include all Pardus as black. There is, I don't know, maybe 25 to 35 percent could be considered black. So, you know, take the 56 percent as a grain of salt. I'm willing to acknowledge that we probably will never know how many actual how many people should be considered black in Brazil because everybody's definition of black is something different. So anyway, um, proof of this is the number of informal black workers, which represent about 61.3 percent of Brazilians, according to the National Continuous, uh, the National Household Sample Survey. Now, this whole thing, you know, I saw this for years all while I was in Sao Paulo because I worked under the table for some years before I had what was called, uh, you know, like a, an official job, you know, a job where you get a pay stub and the taxes are taken out. But a lot of Brazilians continue to work under the table. And these informal workers, they, according to some studies, show us that, well, black and brown people are the majority of those people who work under the table. New law against racial injury. Just like in the professional and educational environment, social relations uh, have also been impacted by racism. According to data from the National Human Rights Ombudsman, in the first semester of 2022, 610 complaints were registered in Brazil for racism. Now, mind you, 610, that just represents, you know, people who actually tried to take action against some discrimination or some racial discrimination that they felt or, you know, racism. But 
these types of things happen every single day. And obviously 610 represents a small parcel of probably everyday racism that people hear all the time. You know, these are just 610 people who actually try to take it to court or something, you know, file a complaint against somebody who they felt discriminated against them. Aiming to combat crimes like this on January 12th, 2023, President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva sanctioned law 14532, which equates the penalties for racial slurs to racism. With this, the penalty for racial injury increases from one to three years to two to five years of imprisonment. Thus, the new legislation also aligns with the understanding of the Supreme Court that in October of 2022, uh, it made racial injury as, race, as well as racism a crime without bail and indefeasible. Now, this is an important development because for years, there's been a difference between what is the actions that are considered injuria hacial, meaning racial injury or racial slur, versus racism. Um, these two accusations have different varying um, differences in the penalties. If many times when black people felt like they were victims of racism, uh, if they went to court or whatever, when the judge would define the act as injuria hacial, it was almost like getting a slap on the wrist. Whereas it's like <laughs> racial injury or racial slur is considered an, an offense against an individual black person, whereas racism is considered, a, you know, an insult to the entire group of black people. And a lot of people will go to court and get a slap on the wrist with a racial slur or injury and just walk scot free, pay a small fine and walk. So this is something that, you know, black Brazilian activists have argued against for, for many years, like, you know, people can just say what they want, do what they want and get away with it because it'll be classified as racial injury. Well, with Lula, it looks like it's getting where it's going to be equal between racial injury and racism. You know, they increase the fine and they increase the, the possibility of how many years of being in prison as well. So again, these are four of the covers of some of the films that I'm going to be talking about here. The first one is Mejida Previsoria, right? This film, how it can be, uh, you could, uh, translated as provisional measure or executive order is directed by the popular uh, actor Lazaro Hamos and it actually features his wife Thais Araujo as one of the main characters this is Thais right here also features Adriana Estevez and the British Brazilian actor Alfred Enoch in the cast the film leads the viewer to reflect on racism in society in the narrative, the Brazilian government, in an attempt to repair its slavery past, decrees a provisional measure or executive order that forces black citizens to go back to Africa in search of their origins. These are just some of the pictures from these are some of the scenes from the film. Um, the measure affects the lives of characters like the couple Capitu, played by Thais Araujo again here, and Antonio, played by Alfred Enoch, as well as their cousin, journalist Andre, played by a uh, singer actor, Cell Georgie, who live in the same apartment. Another photo of Cell Georgie. Amidst the chaos, the characters promote debates on racial and social issues and share their desires to change the destiny of the country. Um, before I move on to the next, I wanted to just discuss this because when this film was released, it was saying that, you know, Executive Order is being hyped as the best Brazilian film since The City of God, Cidade de Deus film I mentioned earlier. The plot surrounds Brazilian government attempting to deport Blacks back to Africa. Now, where have we heard something like that? Uh, let me see here. It was uh, Lázaro Ramos' debut as a film director. Um, it received acclaim on the independent circuit, and according to critics of the Pan-African Film Festival, it is the best Brazilian film since Cidade de Deus or City of God. Uh, let me see here. Is there anything? Okay, so this is Lázaro Ramos. Again, this is his di directorial uh, debut. Uh, let me see. If, uh, United States uh, American Festival announces the film of, of Lázaro Ramos as the best film since uh, Cidade de Deus. Okay. So anyway, getting back to the story or the article, Todos Los Muertos is another film released in 2020. It, it was uh, translated, it translated into English the, under the title of All the Dead Ones. Part of the drama and fiction genre, the cinematic work written by Marco Dutra is set in the city of Sao Paulo in the mid 
what is it, mid-1899, 11 years after the abolition of slavery, which happened in 1888 in Brazil, again, 25 years after uh, slavery ended in the United States, lost after the death of their last housemaid slave, the Sawadis women faced challenges in attempting to adapt to vast changes in Brazil, which had depended on slave labor for nearly four centuries. Former landowners, they tried, they tried to maintain their privileges, which, which were ruined by the Golden Law of 1888, again, abolishing slavery in Brazil. Um, Iná do Nascimento, who is a former slave, played by this woman here, she tries to reunite, uh, reunite her relatives in a scenario that's unfavorable to Black people at the time. Um, as they were former slave labor used on the Soares plantation, they must face a society that excludes that excluded recently freed black people from attaining full citizenship in the country. Okay. Again, where have we heard that story? Okay. Black people were just kind of free, you know, and just, you know, survive on your own. There was no support from any type of government. Matter of fact, with Brazil opening its, 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 uh, its borders to uh, immigrants from Europe, a lot of the jobs were taken up by, by European immigrants and black people were just left to fend for themselves. Again, where have we had to, heard this story? Thus, the film expresses how each family adapted to construct a future amidst the beginning of a new society. Okay. Then we have M8 or Emmy Oito, you know, as they would say in Portuguese, uh, Quando a Morte Socorri a Vida, which means M8 When Death Rescues Life, which was released in 2019. It was awarded the 2021 Grand Prize of Brazilian Film as Best Screenplay. The film directed by Jefferson G. Or Jefferson D. from what I understand is how it's pronounced. I've always said Jefferson G., but it's Jefferson D. from what I understand. It tells the story of the character of Mauricio, which is, who is played by Juan Paiva, a student at the Federal University of Medicine who in his first anatomy class uh, meets M8, the cadaver that will serve as a study for him and his classmates. During the semester, Mauricio uh, tries to discover the identity of the body while facing his own fears and anxieties. However, everything gets worse when he discovers that all the bodies studied in the institution's laboratory are of Black people and that the one who could be there with them is him. So let me see, as I, um, I actually featured this, uh, this, this report, Jefferson G., Jefferson Day. And I've known about him since like, you know, when I first started going to Brazil, particularly when I started visiting Sao Paulo. Um, he's, he's a very much uh, rewarded. He's won a number of uh, awards over the years. And, you know, it's a question here, you know, whenever you get somebody who's in a similar position, he's always going to provoke a uh, comparison. So is director Jefferson Day Brazil's Spike Lee? Filmmaker prepares for release of latest film, M8, When Death Rescues Life, the story of a black medical student. So again, um, <clears throat> the, the main character is, is thinking in his mind, like, why are all the bodies black? Film by director Jefferson Day focuses on the cruel reality of black life and death. You know, and the scenes that I saw from this movie capture so much of, you know, the environment that's going on in Brazil. It showed protests, you know, uh, the fight for quotas and everything are in this film. So, um, you know, the other thing that I thought about when I read about the synopsis of this film is the fact that so many uh, murders are of you know, literally black bodies falling to the ground, either from everyday street violence in Brazil or being taken out by, you know, the, the cruelty, the, the brutality of Brazil's military police. So this is a reality. And in this film, this is just, you know, <laughs> imagine you're a black medical student and you're given the the duty of tending to these corpses and you notice that all of the corpses are black like you know why is that there was something in here let me see if i can find it because it was just very revealing it was something that he said in this film let me see where i can find it it was something to the degree of the character felt more he felt a closer proximities with these with these dead with these uh corp these black corpses than his his classmates in in this course you know over the last 20 years we see that more black brazilians have had access to the university because of uh the affirmative action and quotas 
but it often puts black students in an area that's predominantly white. So they even being able to make it to college, they still feel like a fish out of water because they're surrounded by people who don't look like them and who probably don't identify them, carry a bunch of stereotypes about how they got into the university. So this is what one of the thoughts of the character, like he, he, he comes to identify, why do I feel a closer proximity with the black bodies that are stretched out on these tables rather than my white colleagues in this course, right? Let's see. So the next film, this one is called Cordes y Boltas. And I heard about this film, it, I think it was 2011 or 12. And I actually explored that. Um, short film explores race exclusion and def deferred dreams of black children living under Brazil's dominance of whiteness. Okay. This is a uh, film director, Juliana Vicente. It, it's, you know, this is not a full length film. This is actually a short film. And okay. This is a, uh, Everybody in Brazil knows who this woman is. Her name is Shusha Minigel. And in the 80s and 90s, she was an enormous success in Brazil. Um, she had a number of variety programs targeted at the children's audience. And every kid in Brazil loves Shusha. Loves Shusha. She's a multimillionaire. She's considered one of the richest women in Brazil. You know, she's no by no means just, you know, a great singer or anything, but because she was singing records for kids, she's one of the top selling record artists in the country. I mean, her albums would consistently sell, you know, you, she, she had albums selling half a million and a million, you know, in Brazil, that's quite an accomplishment because the, the meaning of, of gold and platinum in Brazil is not the same as in the United States, uh, whereas in the United States, a platinum album would be a, a 1 million copies. If I'm not mistaken, um, I forget what the numbers are in Brazil. It's like, I don't know, like 100,000, 200,000 or something. And that would be considered gold or platinum in, in Brazil. Um, so Shusha was an enormous success, right? Uh, she had Show Da Shusha, Shusha Show, and all of these different programs that were targeted at kids. And, um, you know, kids loved her. So what this movie is talking about is this group of girls uh, who were Shusha's assistants on stage. It was a, 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 sing, a song and dance group called the Paquitas. And the Paquitas, you look at them, they're all, you know, young white girls. So the point of the film is that a lot, not just white girls were watching Shusha. Every kid in Brazil was watching Shusha, particularly the girls. And every girl had the dream of becoming one of these Paquitas. But if you happen to be black, <laughs> it was a distant dream because, as you can see, none of the girls who were part of the, 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 the Paquitas troupe, none of them were black. They were all white, mostly blonde, young girls. So that's what this particular piece is talking about. This young black girl who has the dream of becoming a black Paquita. Right. So released in 2010. Directed by Juliana Vicente, the film tells the story of the little uh, Joanna, a uh, Jennifer Lauren, a girl who, like many little girls in the 1980s, dreamt of becoming a Paquita, one of the dancer singers in a group appearing on the popular children's program of popular television host Shusha. Her family is successful and supports her dream. However, Joanna is of African descent and there has never been a black Paquita. Uh, through narrative, the work presents to the public the importance of representation for black children in a country with few African descendant characters. You know, and this is what I've said over and over, you know, black people in Brazil were basically invisible, you know, from whether we're talking about the novellas or the film industry. It's only been in the last decade that you're starting to get more prominence of uh, black directors, uh, protagonists, lead, you know, leading uh, leading actors in different films or novellas. A lot is going on right now when they're talking about like three of the top novellas that's on television right now are have primarily black cast. So things are starting to change. But in order to under, order to understand why these changes are so important, they're so revolutionary. You have to understand where black representation was. You know, it was it was just minuscule, you know, you go back 30 years, even 20 years. But now that is starting to change a little bit. Um, what else do I want to talk about here? OK, so this is another piece that I did on the on the uh, the, the uh, Shusha and her Paquitas. This article from 2015, where were the black girls? 
how the uh, blonde TV host Shusha and her all blonde teen singing group taught one woman about racism. So again, you know, they were all dressed alike. They were like little Shushas. And most this was Shusha when she was involved with the, you know, the famed uh, soccer king Pele who died last December. But this is what the Paquitas look like. So, you know, all blonde here. There was no space for any, you know, black girls, you know, on uh, on Shusha's show. And this is what, you know, this is what the question was. I've read so many interviews by different uh, famous black women in Brazil, you know, in the age range, I don't know, from 30 to 45 or 50, whatever. And they all talked about wanting to be a Paquita. They all, you know, our kids get in the mirror and take the brush and they're singing in the mirror. Everybody wanted to be a Paquita. But if you were black, <laughs> you weren't going to see any representation. Why wasn't there a black Paquita? A uh, host leaves TV personality Shusha speechless after pointing out there were no black girls in her popular song and dance group. So this is where Shusha was. Uh, she was confronted with that question. And every time she always puts it off to her producer, says, oh, well, she didn't want black girls on the show. So that's what this particular film is about. And again, it's all about black representation, um, a society that teaches people to be ashamed of being black leads people to deny that they're being black and not wanting to be black because they don't see people that they can see themselves, you know, uh, people they can look up to on the television screen. So these things are, are, are quickly changing. Maybe I shouldn't say quickly because this has been a battle that's been going on for several decades in Brazil in terms of its media representation. But so um, these are just four films. I have a number of other ones that I want to talk about. Um, I'll get into those in another article, but these are just four films. Um, I, it, let me let me go back because I, I had a list of where you can find some of these films and what platforms they're available, like uh, Google uh, Global Play, which is a, you know, Brazilians, the, the top uh, television network in Brazil is called Global. So this is Global Play. You can actually pay for it online. Some of these movies are actually free available on youtube and you can actually get english subtitles on them they're available on google play netflix apple tv so you know these productions are are getting out like i said i'm impressed with the uh the increase of of black actors black protagonism black cast years ago it was totally impossible to think you could go to a brazilian movie and see an all black cast but slowly i'm starting to see this and I'm, i'll have to talk about more of those mute movies in the future in the future so for now I'm um, just curious to know what you thought about this article. Um, I've said for years, as as much as Brazil and Brazilians would like to point to the United States uh, as the true racist country, you know, black representation in American media far outweighs what you've ever seen in Brazil. But as I said, this is an intriguing time because these things are slowly changing in Brazil. And the fact that you have four films. This film, I wouldn't say had a majority black cast, but the, these films here, you know, you have an equal mixture of, you know, black and non-black people. But you other you have other films and even television series and novellas that are featuring, you know, primarily black cast these days. So, you know, like some serious changes going on in Brazil's media these days. Anyway, just curious to know what you thought about this. Uh, this article about four Brazilian films that discuss racism. Um. We'd love to know your comments on this. Of course, I, I can't expect you to give full comments without having seen these films. But just the fact that they're being talked about and these films are being released and there's the opportunities are opening up for black actors and directors and screenwriters in Brazil. That's something to discuss. Uh, love to hear your comments in the comment section. Uh, definitely consider subscribing to this channel if you watch more than a few videos here. Um, share the video. I always like to spark the discussion and, you know, click on that notification bell so that uh, you'll be one of the first people to receive my videos as I post them up. So with that said, I'm going to end this video here and hope to see you guys in the next video.